If he'd taken Tylenol, he'd be stopping for more pills right now. Only Aleve has the strength to stop tough pain for up to 12 hours with just one pill. Tylenol can't do that. Aleve. All day strong, all day long. Also try Aleve Direct Therapy with TENS technology for lower back pain relief. This feels entirely different, entirely different. Whether it's preparing for the actual show or interviewing guests or meeting with my team and talking about our rundown, it's a joy. Finally, it's been three weeks of uncertainty for people who simply can't reach loved ones in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. But tonight, we're with one family when they finally make the connection they've been waiting for. Here's Gabe Gutierrez. In the wake of Hurricane Maria, not even a third of the island's cell towers are working. As long as they, care they find out, yeah. For Felix Vasquez and his wife Dawn, the last three weeks have brought a deafening silence. It's been horrible. It's been horrible. From their home in Westport, Connecticut, they desperately tried and failed to reach Felix's mother, Carol Bruno. We've sent numerous emails daily. For some relatives on the U.S. mainland, frustration is mounting, posting cries for help on social media. We've gone above and beyond to find her, and we have not stopped. So we travel from San Juan to the town of Manatee to look for Carol. We pull up to her address, Are you Carol? and there she is. How hard has it been to, be, to not be able to speak with your family? Well, it's been extremely hard, but, you know, we tried. She still hasn't spoken to her son until we offer her our satellite phone. Hey. Hi. Hi, Hi, Mommy. Hi. <laughs> oh, my God, so Carol. How are you doing? Hello. I love you. I love you, too. You okay? Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Tonight, this family is finally reconnected. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, Manatee, Puerto Rico. So many people still living in the communications blackout. Happy to see them make that connection. We appreciate you spending part of your evening with us. That is Nightly News for this Wednesday. I'm Lester Holt. For all of us at NBC News, good night. Tonight's show was taped prior to Hurricane Harvey. We know that all our viewers join us in wishing our friends in Texas a fast and full recovery. Stay tuned as we honor this great state with Wheel of Fortune Salute to Texas. Here's a Texas flashback from 2001. I'm very picky. He did it, yeah. Woo! Woo! I need a hug. Ladies and gentlemen, here are the stars of America's Game. That's Sajak and Vanna White. Oh, yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Hi, y'all, as we say in Jack. And cut green peppers and onions for just $11. The following is an 11 Alive News special presentation made possible by financial contributions from AARP the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, and the American Cancer Society Action Network. 
1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta. It's the announcement that put Atlanta on an international stage. But truth be told, the city's rise began decades earlier. We're on the move now. Yes, sir. When Sons of Atlanta changed a nation through a peaceful movement. And it was through strong leadership that led to the construction of the world's busiest airport. The legacies of former mayors William Hartsfield, Ivan Allen Jr., and Sam Massell are immortalized in the city's landscape. I uh, enjoyed it, uh, both the difficult times uh, and the uh, pleasures. But as Atlanta's demographics became more diverse, I was the youngest mayor of the city of Atlanta in history. A new era of leadership ushered in. In 1973, Maynard Jackson became the city's first black mayor, followed by Andrew Young, Bill Campbell, Shirley Franklin, and now Kasim Reed. Our next step is to make the city of Atlanta one of the leading cities of the world. Who will lead Atlanta the next four years? And what are the top issues voters want addressed? Up next, from the first Center for the Arts on the Georgia Tech campus, the mayoral candidates debate the issues. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Hellinger from 11 Alive, and it is an extraordinary time to be in this extraordinary city of unparalleled growth. All you have to do is look around you from the west side to the east side to the south side to the north side in Buckhead. There are cranes everywhere, building happening all over the place. The question is, where do we go from here? There's going to be great change in government forthcoming, a new mayor. We're going to see a new council president as well, as well as council members and Atlanta Public Schools, the board is going to look very different as well. The question not only is, where are we in 2017, but where are we going? And that is why we are here tonight. This is a place that has seen debate before. 25 years ago, almost to the night, the VP debate between Gore, Quayle, and Admiral Stockdale. Where were you October 13th, 1992? Well, this stage was full of debate, full of all kinds of thoughts, observations, and musings about government from a national scene. Tonight, it will be local, it will be regional, and it will be interesting. We are glad to have you here. We have seven candidates directly behind me tonight. And the reason that they are here is because they have polled well. Here's how that polling looks. The 11 Alive News poll conducted by Survey USA shows Mary Norwood still strongly in the lead with 28% unchanged since July. City Councilwoman Keisha Lance Bottoms placed second and poised to make a runoff in December, very likely. To still have a double-digit lead and to be first in almost every demographic is really just a great, great expression of um, the people's support for me. I always thought that when people started to pay attention and they started to look at what we have done and what we will do, um, I thought that our numbers would rise and your poll bearers set out. The next tier of candidates is led by City Council President Cesar Mitchell. So we feel very good. Should you be gaining a little more at this point in the election? No, we feel good. Based upon our plan, based upon the things that we have scheduled, uh, the things that are going to happen over the next few weeks, we feel very good. Our poll shows Mitchell with 10%, followed by former Atlanta Chief Financial Officer Peter Amon. Former State Senator Vincent Ford, City Councilman Kwanzaa Hall, and former City Council President Kathy Woolard, all tied at 7%. We should point out that 14% of voters remain undecided. Well, here are the rules, and they are basic. You have been together since January about 40 times, so you probably know these much better than not only our audience behind me, but me as well. It will go this way. Each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. If a candidate is mentioned by another candidate, that candidate will get a 30-second rebuttal, and I will jump in to make sure that everybody gets equity or everybody is treated fairly in terms of the amount of time that they receive. At the conclusion of our debate, each candidate will get one minute to talk directly to the voters, and that's about it. So we are all set and ready to go. Let the discourse begin. Each one of you on the stage has previously called affordable housing a key issue. Tonight, we want to go beyond the surface and discuss the issue in depth. Mary Norwood, you are leading the polls, so you get the first question. You've been on Atlanta City Council since 2001. And in those 16 years, 
What accomplishments of yours can you point to that has made housing more affordable for Atlantans of a lower income? Well, most recently, I have been the co-chair of the Code Enforcement Commission, and what we have done is to change the state code so that we can deploy a different way of going after code enforcement and taking abandoned houses and returning them to productive use. That will be an affordable housing supply for city workers, whether firemen, police officers, other city employees, teachers, and others. So it will open up thousands of houses houses that have been abandoned for us to be able to use for affordable housing. City Councilwoman Bottoms, the same question for you. What, what accomplishments can you point to of yours that has made housing more affordable for Atlanta residents who cannot afford the escalating price of homes, of condominiums, of any kind of residence here in our area? Thank you for the question and thank you for having me. I am very honored to have asked the City of Atlanta to explore the creation of displacement-free zones, and that specifically addresses rising rents, I'm sorry, rising property taxes, and also provides a fund for homeowners to be able to fix up their houses. I explored this concept after facilitating the sale of Turner Field, and what I heard from the community repeatedly was a concern that they would be priced out of the neighborhood. We rolled this out in the Vine City English Avenue area. Area, and I was very pleased today to announce a $1 billion plan towards affordable housing. As mayor, I will ask for a partnership, a public and private partnership, $500 million from the public sector and $500 million from the private and philanthropic sector so that we can expand this throughout the city and so we can achieve the goal of 50,000 affordable housing units in the city. City Council President Cesar Mitchell, same question for you. Well, I have a record of producing affordable housing, not only as uh, a council member, but also as a real estate attorney. Uh, in my time on city council, I've created uh, four of the city's 10 tax allocation districts. Uh, these revitalization districts are really focused on providing more affordable housing in communities throughout the city. Uh, these particular districts are located in South uh, and West Atlanta. I've also been the author of Enterprise Zones, which really are focused on ensuring that development that happens in certain communities have the kinds of incentives uh, that allow for affordable housing to be created. Uh, when I I'm mayor, I'm going to make sure we create partnerships, uh, also initiatives and policies that increase affordable housing. My goal is to ensure that we take blighted homes in our city uh, and turn them into places where police officers and teachers and firefighters uh, can live, the creative class, senior citizens, and growing families. It's called Blight to Light, and I look forward uh, to bringing that to the city of Atlanta as mayor. On this same topic, last spring, when the new tax assessments came out, many homeowners faced increases of 20 percent in the city. Now, some of the inner city faced 100 to 300 percent increases. We've heard from so many of them. If the assessment laws do not change at the legislative level, which they may or may not, if elected mayor, what would you do to ensure that people can afford to stay in their homes? And we, we want to hear from Kathy Willard, Vincent Ford, Quanta Hall, and Peter Amon on that. Mr. Amon, if you would begin. Certainly. Uh, currently, we are in the process, as a city, of forcing out of Atlanta the very people that built Atlanta. And to me, that's unacceptable. As mayor, I'm going to bring both the will and the skill to address the affordable housing issues, including the tax issue. On the affordable housing side, we're going to work together with the Atlanta Housing Authority, uh, with the City of Atlanta, Invest Atlanta, and others to make sure that we create new supply and retain existing supply of affordable housing. We're going to do that through community development corporations, community land trusts, uh, housing opportunity bonds, and a number of other things. On the tax issue specifically, this has been broken for years. We have to fix this. A dozen years ago, the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution did an expose on how broken the tax assessment system is. As mayor, I will work with the county and the tax assessor's office and the state, if necessary, to fix the process, and then we're going to have to look at the homestead exemption, and we're going to have to look at possible caps to annual increases so we do not force out of Atlanta the people that built Atlanta. Quanta Hall. I represent the heart of the city, downtown Midtown, Old 44, Emmett Park, Ponce Highlands. We felt those pains, and we're thankful that the county was able to roll things back, but we've got to do more than that. I think we need to look at uh, property tax freezes for those who are longtime residents, look at age, look at potentially the conversation about 
a school uh, tax relief program for seniors who are on a fixed income. And, you know, in terms of projects and programs going forward, we also need to look at how we can have projects that come on the, on the rolls that will be permanently affordable for the long term. On the former uh, Atlanta Housing Authority properties, there are 11 of those, about 400 acres. They're all empty right now. There are 4,000 empty houses, 4,000 empty apartment units on the west, southwest, southeast. All of these could be regenerated. I've also been able to preserve affordability in the Boulevard Corridor, 700 units. Average income is $3,000 a year. Average rent starts at $12 a month. And we've also worked to generate another set of 87 new units called City Lights. And we have City Lights 1 and 2. I mean, two and three coming as well, 500 units at the MLK Marta Station, at Peachtree Center, and underground. Vincent Fort? Yeah. I will uh, do what I have done uh, while I was at the state legislature, that is expand the homestead exemption for fixed income senior citizens. I've done that before. I'll ask the legislature to do it again. The thing I will not do is vote or work to displace Atlantas from neighborhoods that they live in. The council members who are here tonight have all voted to displace people from the People's Town neighborhood in the Atlanta Avenue block. We're joined tonight by Tanya Washington and the Dardens, two of the four families that remain on that block, 30 families excluded, kicked out by the city, eminent domain for a retention pond. People can talk about displacement-free zones all they want. But when they vote to displace people, they ought to be held accountable. Uh, what we have had here is people talking about gentrification and keeping people in their homes. But the fact of the matter is they work to displace Atlantans, and it's in court right now, that case. Kathy Willard. And Jeff, the question you asked was related to... The, the, the question was relates to about as property assessments have grown high, and, and, and let me just uh, reiterate here, uh, many have seen increases who live in the city of 20 percent, some inner cities 100 to 300 percent. If the assessment laws don't change at the legislative level, and we've heard, we've been hearing for weeks and months that it will indeed change, but if elected mayor, what would you do to ensure that people can afford to stay inside their homes and their neighborhoods? Great. Well, first of all, we can't not have the General Assembly agree with us and help us make these changes because it's essential for the health of the city and the city is essential for the health of the state. First, we have to make sure that the basic homestead exemption for everybody is, is uh, more than $30,000 a year and has been updated to relate to this uh, to current day dollars. Then when it has to be stackable so that seniors get an additional homestead exemption and that people who are low income get an additional homestead exemption so that it really adds up to something meaningful. Um, secondly, we need to make sure that institutional investors that are sitting on top of thousands of boarded up homes and paying very minimal taxes pay their fair share so that we can make sure that we're actually taxing everybody fairly and that we're not overtaxing some people and as a result. And third, we need to work with APS to really have a conversation about reducing seniors' contribution to school taxes. Uh, and finally, we, may, we need to make sure that we are really building a robust fund for home owner repairs because we have a lot of seniors who are in their homes Homes. They can't fix the roof, you know, they can't fix the, the bathroom floor, and we need to make sure they don't lose their home just because the roof was leaking. Gentrification has been a great Satan of this campaign. And, and this subject really creates a lot of passion, I think, for any of us who have lived in the city for a long time. Gentrification, is it, is it always bad? I mean, 35 years ago in Virginia Highland, you could buy a nice house for under $100,000, and all along North Highland, those businesses were all boarded up. Same with Inman, same with Candler, Sherwood Forest was kind of a mess. Uh, you can go on and on. Uh, are there cases where gentrification is not that? I mean, where would the city coffers be without the increase in property taxes that we have seen in all of these in-town and mid-town neighborhoods over the last 35 years? APS would be broke. I mean, how would we lure business to relocate here? Mary Norwood? 
Well, what we need to do is to have, as the city redevelops, and we are going to have 800,000 new people come into the city, what we need to do is to have new residents and density along the commercial corridors. And we have many of those that are underutilized today. We essentially have two-thirds of the city that has seen no growth in development in the past several decades. And we have seen a third of the city that has been developed over and over and over again. So the issue is you don't want anyone displaced. And there are three things that ha need to be done. Number one, the property taxes have to be st um, frozen. Number two, you have to get the homes re um, renovated. And number three, you need to alert homeowners that don't take that offer that seems so high when you won't be able to live near here if, in fact, that you accept that offer. Mr. Mitchell? Well, first of all, gentrification is what happens when the value of a, a particular community increases, uh, and that comes with good and bad. Uh, and we've got to make sure that we're addressing those negative side effects. We've got to make sure that when, when people move into a community and when uh, they come and they buy homes, that the families and, and folks who are there are not moved out. And so in order to do that, we've got to make sure that we're very focused on providing affordable housing. We've got to make sure that we have strong taxing policy in place. I sit on the board of the Georgia Municipal Association, and this summer, I created a statewide uh, tax assessment task force. And the purpose of this task force was to make sure we created policy that can be passed at the state level to ensure uh, that a senior citizen is not moved out of her home just because the taxes are rising because of a home next to her may be actually a more valuable home. We've got to make sure that with gentrification, we're not allowing uh, displacement to occur. And when I'm mayor, I'm going to make sure we have strong policies and strong partnerships to prevent that from happening. Same question, Ms. Bottoms. Redevelopment in and of itself is not a bad thing, but the bad thing is that we often lose the fabric of our communities. And people who have stuck with communities for any number of decades who have been wanting and longing for the redevelopment, the basics, like a grocery store and a pharmacy in the neighborhood, often can't afford to stay there. We do know that our education system improves when our, when our economies are mixed within our neighborhoods. That's the good part. But we have to be very careful that it's not at the expense of the people within our communities. That is why I fought for the creation of displacement-free zones, and that is why I want to make sure that we have a mechanism in place to keep Atlanta affordable. It impacts everything about this city. Ms. Rima. So at the highest level, we have a structural problem in the city of Atlanta. We are only 8% roughly, of the metropolitan population. That's one of the lowest percentages of any major city. Uh, there are a variety of ways of dealing with that challenge, but it creates real challenges. One of the ways of dealing with it is to increase density in the city. We are one of the least dense cities in the United States, major cities. And so the growth that some have referred to already is important. We need to grow the city of Atlanta. We need to grow population in the city of Atlanta for a whole variety of reasons. But we need to do so in a way where we are not forcing out of Atlanta the people that built Atlanta, as I said. And we do that by creating specific affordable housing at multiple income levels. So at 30% of area median income, which means four or $500 a month, so you can afford a house on minimum wage, on up. And we do that through a variety of, variety of incentives to developers and others. So we want our neighborhoods to revitalize. We want the boarded up houses to be improved, uh, but we don't want to push the people out. Uh, another example I would give is I helped uh, found a nonprofit called the West Side Future Fund. Uh, and we created a philanthropic fund that paid the increases in property taxes that longtime residents of English Avenue and Vine City incurred, and that helped keep those individuals in place. Mr. Hall. Well, permanent affordability is something that we can definitely do in this city. As I mentioned, we have 11 former Atlanta authority, Housing Authority properties, at least 400 acres, and the area around them is another 500 acres or so. So you're talking 1,000 acres. If we do 50 units an acre, we could do a very nice number of units that could be long-term, permanently affordable. Gentrification and new energy regeneration, revitalization of a neighborhood like Old Fourth Ward isn't necessarily bad, but we have to have protections in place 
to keep people in their neighborhoods. I've introduced legislation to bring forth tiny houses in our city. We can do micro units. We can have them all to be affordable. That's not the only place that people can stay. We need permanent senior units at a variety of price points, as, you, as you've heard other people mention. 500, 600, 700, 800. We're the baristas, the artists, the empty nesters. We need to make our city a place that everyone can live in. It's doable. We have models, examples, uh, the East Lake, uh, housing projects were reconverted, and they were done in that manner. Centennial Place was done in my council district. We can do this, but you have to have the will. And as mayor, I'll do the same great work that I've done in the heart of the city, all on the west side, the southwest, southeast sides of Atlanta. Governor Willard. Thanks. You know, those neighborhoods that you just mentioned were the neighborhoods that were gentrifying when I was a city council member there. And um, I, that's one of the reasons we started working on the Beltline, because what we wanted to do was make sure we were orienting density around a transportation corridor. Fifteen years later, what we're finding because of the run-up in our economy, as well as uh, the traffic problems that we have and our failure to, pay, to expand affordable housing, is we've got a crisis on our hand. So we've got to deal with the crisis first, and the first piece we have to deal with are the people who are being immediately displaced and the people who are homeless in this community that have not been accommodated. We can do that. Other people have brought forward ideas and talked about land that we own and other things that we can do to have permanent affordability, but we also need to drive gentrification in the way we want to drive it, so that neighborhoods that haven't seen commercial development see commercial development, and we're using tools like Invest Atlanta to incentivize businesses like grocery stores and pharmacies to locate in communities that haven't seen those kind of amenities in a very, very long time. And I think if we can prepare for the future by building transit lines, building affordable housing, and then driving the tax base that increases to provide those amenities for the people who don't have things that they need right now. I think we can build a successful city. Vincent Ford? Here we go again. <laughs> I think I heard one of my fellow panelists say that gentrification isn't so bad. That person hasn't spoken to the people I've spoken to for the last year about how they, people who have been forced out of neighborhoods because the rents are rising. He had, they haven't talked to the people who are out there being displaced outside of the city because they can't find rents that are affordable. While I was at the state capitol working for Roy Barnes, working with Roy Barnes to stop predatory lending, the destabilizing of neighborhoods, people taking away neighborhoods, in those years, down at City Council, uh, gentrification 10 years ago was about 10 to 20 percent. Today, even as we speak, Atlanta 70 percent gentrified. In four more years, at the end of this term, Atlanta will be over 80, 85 percent gentrified. Gentrify, uh, gentrification is so bad unless you're victimized by it. All right, well, let's move on. We're going to move on from housing affordability to uh, a subject that we're all concerned about. Everybody is concerned about crime. Now, according to a recent 11 Alive poll, crime is the number one issue in this campaign. Councilman Hall, you, you recently introduced a bill that Mayor Reed has now signed that decriminalizes marijuana in the city of Atlanta. First of all, why did you uh, introduce the measure, and what impact will it have, do you think, on police? And we want to give everybody an opportunity to address this subject as well. I should have worn my green tie for my friends in the audience. Um, I'll say, you know, first and foremost— um, You're on a roll. Yeah, right? yes, that's right. There's a terrible disparity that exists in our city, in our state, and in our country. Uh, African-American men and women are penalized at a greater rate than our white counterparts for possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. And for that reason, I introduced uh, this legislation. It was a conversation that started last summer with the students who were pro protesting in the heart of the city in the wake of the transparency uh, conversations around officer-involved shootings around the country that had occurred, and there were riots everywhere. And I wanted to lean forward and begin to bring this innovation around criminal justice reform that I had already begun with ban in the box or um, felon reentry for job opportunities in our city. So what it really speaks to also is putting our resources to work for the biggest outcome. Instead of having our officers focus on petty crimes, 
they can focus on the serious, more violent crimes. And we're wasting millions of dollars on an annual basis, jailing young people primarily. They're losing their college scholarships. They're losing their homes, their jobs. They're becoming unemployable, all because of possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. And in this case, I'll also say weed, as they call it. So that was why I introduced it. And I'm thankful that the mayor and my colleagues supported it. All right. Ms. Norwood, your thoughts? Same subject on marijuana. And um, if you could give us your view on uh, how this plays out in the city and your take on all that you have heard over the last 24 hours involving uh, the mayor signing this into, uh, into law. Well, I supported the legislation because I think that what we need to do in Atlanta is to be very focused on violent crimes, on crimes that are alarming to all of our citizens all over the city. I have received the endorsement of both of the police unions and the fire union because of my strong stance on public safety. I went to bat for our officers and our firefighters to get the raises that had been denied them through a long and torturous several years. And so it is very important for us that we are putting our efforts and our public safety efforts toward those violent crimes that are terrifying to our residents all across the city. That is everything from repeat offenders to having alternatives for our young people that are getting caught up and will become career cr uh, criminals if we do not take care of them right now. The city has just put in their, the first wraparound service center, the At Promise Service Center over in English Avenue, Vine City, which is taking young people who have a first or second offense and making sure that we can give them the services they need so that we don't perpetuate the violent crime and uh, perpetuate their entry into more violent acts. So it's very important for us at every stage, whether it's repeat offenders, whether it's juveniles, and it's having the police focus on the most violent and the things that really alarm the citizens. Mr. Mitchell? You know, my father was an, an Atlanta police officer, and he walked a foot beat in neighborhoods like Perry Homes and along Camelton Road. And one of the things that he always wanted to do was to make sure that the, the folks that he kept safe really believed that he was going to be fair. Uh, he didn't like to arrest people for silly crimes. Uh, some of the old crimes you might remember were old things such as maybe spitting on the ground or throwing uh, trash on the ground. Uh, this marijuana legislation is something I support because really, in my opinion, it is a strong way to start down the path of, of, of criminal justice reform. Uh, we cannot have our young people and we can't have working families, working individuals being put in jail for things that are really not necessary. It destabilizes not only their family, it destabilizes their ability to continue to earn a living. It destabilizes our community and makes our family uh, really not our city a place that certainly is not as good as it can be. Uh, when I'm mayor, we're going to make sure that we continue things such as the legislation I introduced called pretrial uh, intervention to make sure uh, that people are not trapped into the system, uh, but instead have an opportunity uh, to face responsibility, but also not be put in jail unnecessarily uh, for something they really should not be in jail for. Ms. Bottoms. My father went to prison when I was eight years old, so I unfortunately know the negative impacts that having someone in your family incarcerated has on the family. I know what it looks like to walk into a prison and to see primarily African-American men, um, many with families like my dad had. So I su always supported the sentiment of the law, and I offered an amendment to the legislation based on education. My primary concern has been that as lawmakers, we have a responsibility to be responsible. And so even as we are here today on the campus of Georgia Tech, a Georgia Tech police officer can still arrest someone for possession of marijuana and still charge them under state law and they can still go to jail. So my hope is that we will get the word out that it is still illegal to have marijuana less than an ounce in the city of Atlanta. The real change really should have come from our state level, and it's unfortunate that our state leaders were too weak to actually make a change that mattered. Ms. Willard.
Well, I'm not on the Atlanta City Council now, but I did support the legislation to decriminalize marijuana. But what I think we should be thinking a lot about is how can we, um, in terms of dealing with um, crime in the city of Atlanta, think about how we get guns off our streets. You know, we've got young people who have access to illegal guns. We've got people who are mentally ill who have access to guns in this state because we have a guns everywhere sort of mentality. So I think that's something that we need to be talking about. But we've also talked at city council for a while about merging the Atlanta Detention Center and the Fulton County Jail. If you go to our prison system, you'll see a lot of people who are homeless, people who are mentally ill people who have substance abuse and alcohol problems, if we merge those two centers, we'd save about $35 million a year, and we could devote those resources to finding homes for people, putting wraparound services together, and housing somebody in, in, in a... Um, in a place that's different than a jail. And uh, a lot of the folks that our police encounter on the streets have those problems, and, and that's where they go, and that's where they end up staying. So I think we need to relook at our whole criminal justice system, our judicial system, how we interact with people, and really uh, steal some best practices from other places, but get some savings here. We are staying on the concurrent theme here of marijuana as we go round robin on the subject. Peter Amon. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not on city council. In fact, this is the first time I've run for office. I did support the move and the path to decriminalization, however. But I was chief operating officer. So in 2010 and 2011, I had management responsibility for supervising all of the city departments, and especially the Atlanta Police Department. And I'm in awe of what I saw those officers do. Every few weeks, I would go to a murder scene, and I would stay for several hours so I could understand both how we can do better uh, in solving crimes, but how we can prevent them, and how we can support neighborhoods. So yes, we need to do targeted pay raises for officers to retain more officers. Yes, we need to get up to our full strength of officers. Um, but we're not going to police our way out of crime. The next big drop in crime in the city of Atlanta is going to be driven by opportunity. It's going to be driven by opportunity and education. Early childhood learning, a mayor who works with the Atlanta public school system, and things like the At Promise Youth Center uh, that I actually helped found as part of the Atlanta Police Foundation, uh, as well as organizations like Partners for Home, which I founded that helped the homeless. Uh, so there's a variety of things that we need to do. Uh, it starts with policing, but must include services and education. Mr. Ford. Thank you, Jeff. Um, the first thing I want to do is thank this community activists, the civil rights activists that worked so hard to pass this legislation. Politicians may take credit, but if it wasn't for the community, this would, this, the decriminalization of marijuana would not have occurred. But let me tell you something. Um, Dr. King had a phrase about the fierce urgency of now. Uh, the business community intervened last year. This legislation was introduced in the spring of 2016. The business community intervened and slowed down this legislation, told council members to sit down and be quiet. They did that. As a matter of fact, two work sessions on the decrim bill were canceled by the author. In January of this year, a young man by the name of DeAndre Phillips was detained by the Atlanta police. They smelled marijuana in his car. Whatever happened, he ended up dead, shot dead. What we have to do is do the right thing when it's necessary. Not election year politics. No young man should have to die in order for politicians to wake up. All right. We are going to take a 60 second break here and we will continue on, on the issue of uh, transparency and poll and we will do that. In fact, we will begin right now, and we will go to that break shortly. So let's start with transparency. Here we go. In a recent 11 Alive poll, 51% of those surveyed said the federal probe into Atlanta will have a major role in deciding who they will vote for. Each of you brings various levels of city government experience. Do you want to say to voters about corruption anything? How do you want to, how do you want to say this investigation should break down or what it means and why you didn't know about it? We will begin with Cesar Mitchell. You know, I've been speaking up on the issue of corruption in city government for uh, a long time. Uh, about a month ago, uh, for starters, I 
made a proposal and called on all my colleagues who are on the city council to stand up and institute a moratorium on all contracts that don't expire till this time next year. Uh, when I'm mayor, I'm going to make sure that we bring transparency, openness, uh, and certainly fairness to city government. Uh, right now, what we've seen since I made my proposal, uh, we've seen uh, the procurement director uh, plead guilty. We've also seen uh, a person who is a contractor with the city uh, funnel thousands of dollars to one of the mayoral candidates' campaign. Uh, we've also seen this same contractor bid on four of the ten contracts at the airport that really should be uh, bidded on next year because they don't expire till late next year. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. When I am mayor, I'm going to make sure uh, that we have an uh, office of compliance, where we have an independent compliance officer who's going to root out waste, fraud, and abuse every day in every way in city government. I'm also going to make sure that we put all of the contracts, the procurement process from RFP to signature by the mayor online for the public to view at any point in the process. I'm going to make sure that we have an audit uh, that, that really takes an opportunity for us to see and understand what is happening in city government with respect to our procurement process. We're going to revise and reform the procurement process so that every citizen in the city knows that city government is operating in an open, fair, and transparent fashion and knows that they can have confidence in the work that's happening at City Hall. That is my promise as mayor. Ms. Bottoms. I've been a practicing attorney for over 20 years. I was a judge for six years, also served as a prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney. What I know is that you can't legislate your way out of bad behavior. That's why it's important that we have trust in the process and not in people. The process. We need to immediately begin an audit of our procurement department. We also need to move to an electronic bidding process. Right now, we still have a paper-based bidding process. We also need to have all of our elected officials and all employees who work in sensitive areas within procurement file their tax returns along with our already filed financial disclosures. This gives another layer, another safeguard for us to have complete insight into what's happening with not just the process, but the people who oversee the process. Harry Norwood. I will do three, three things. Number one, I have committed and already have legislation, which Felicia Moore and I co-sponsored, to have all of the city's finances online, including checks. So that will be all contracts, that will be all expenses, that will be absolutely everything. So it will be available to everyone. Secondly, I had said that I'll have a forensic audit of all funds. Right now, we have a cash pool. We have a lot of money flowing in and out of that cash pool. I want all the money to be where it's supposed to be, so it is ready to be spent for the appropriate reasons without delay, and I have heard several war stories about that. Number three, I have committed to having a new procurement head who is at a cabinet level who will come from a publicly held company where every single procurement that they have overseen has been subject to public scrutiny. I want to completely revamp the procurement department because this has not worked. Council is not a part of that process at all, uh, but it is critical that not only the next administration knows that process, but we all, council and the citizens, know and have confidence in that process. Vincent Fort. This past legislative session, I introduced a piece of legislation which would have created the position of an inspector general at, at City Hall. They would have investigative and even prosecutorial responsibilities. It passed through the Senate in the House uh, when the uh, administration sent over, they sent over their in-house lobbies, but they also sent out, sent over to the state capitol a silk stocking law firm lawyer to stop my legislation, and they did stop it. It was, I was told it was a political stunt, uh, and that we had enough uh, uh, safeguards at City Hall. See how that's worked out? Uh, <laughs> We need, when I'm mayor, when I'm mayor, we're going to have an inspector general who will investigate and make uh, referrals to the authorities to send people to jail if they violate the law. But we need somebody over at City Hall that's watching out for the taxpayers and their, uh, and on uh, rooting out uh, corruption. It's not a stunt to make people do the right thing. Quanta Hall. When I'm mayor, we'll have a top-to-bottom 
audit and review of the procurement process as well as other departments. There are 8,000 employees in the city. I think there's a lot of room to still figure out where the extra waste and excess is. It's not about bodies, but I think there's a lot of room for movement in there. Uh, the, the corruption always seems to be around the airport. I think there's room for us to review what's happening out there. There's a lot of people who've been out there for a long time. I think it's time for a change. Uh, we've got to change that. And, you know, online procurement for sure is something we should be doing, obviously. But in every organization, whether it's a government or a private sector organization, you see corruption happen. You see this type of stuff. But you have to get at it and root it out quickly. Unfortunately, right now, we have three open investigations from what we've heard. So this is ongoing, and I think it will continue to unfold, unfortunately. It's embarrassing. It's a bad mark on our city. But when I'm mayor, I'm going to make sure that we've rooted it all out, we'll cooperate, and move forward and close this chapter. Mr. Raymond. Right. So as mayor, I'm going to do two important things. The first is set the tone and set an example. Leadership matters and what the mayor does and says matters. Seven years ago, when I started as chief operating officer, any time I saw anything questionable, I had it investigated and I had people held accountable. Unfortunately, in many cases, that meant that people were fired because they broke the procurement code. So I will lead by example. And I'm still doing this, frankly, in my campaign. Just a few days ago, uh, we got video of one of my canvassers uh, saying something that wasn't true about Ms. Uh, Willard. Uh, I immediately investigated it, and although he was very apologetic and very contrite and was a young man, uh, we had to let him go. And so I've apologized uh, both uh, in person and on camera to Ms. Willard, but I wanted to do it here. I'm sorry on behalf of uh, my campaign, and I, I hope you'll accept my apology. Thank you. So. Examples matter, leadership matters. There's a lot of specific things we can do from recording the conversations between vendors and city officials, from putting up a database not only of every check of the city, but the company it goes to and who owns that company, because that's how things are slipping through the cracks. Who owns the company? Who's getting the money as an individual? There are a whole series of process changes I will make in addition to providing strong leadership. Ms. Willard. You know, Jeff, I, when I was in elected office, I had never received, I never received any ethics complaint. Um, and I think that honesty and integrity is, is most important. It's most important to me, and I think we do have to set it at the top. When I chaired the city's transportation committee, I was responsible for the, looking over the expansion of the fifth runway. And one day we were having a hearing about moving massive amounts of dirt, and there were some people in the room that seemed unusual to me. And I kept asking questions and asking questions and actually asked questions for about six weeks um, until we finally kind of got to the bottom of it. And as a result, some people went to jail. So there's things you can do even as a council member when things don't seem right. But when I'm, in, when I'm mayor, I'm going to change things from top to bottom because it's not just procurement. We hear about it in our permits department when, when people hire expediters just so that they can get a permit. There's something wrong with that. I don't know what an expediter needs to be doing, but everybody should be able to walk in and get their business done. Um, I can talk on and on about procurements, but one of the things I want to say um, is that there are other things that we need to do um, about changing our laws relative to how people work. Elected officials and people who are uh, employees of the city should never have a financial relationship outside of City Hall with somebody who do, does business with the city. Nor should anybody who's an elected official or an employee work for a vendor immediate, immediately upon leaving City Hall. And I also finally want to go and make sure that we're taking money out of politics here. Because of Citizens United, we can't stop corporate contributions, but we can limit all contributions. And I'd like to see future elections limit all contributions from any person or, or corporation to $100 a person. There's simply no need for us to be spending all this time sitting on the phone asking people for money when really we ought to be going door to door, talking to people, and finding out what voters want and getting their votes that way. All right. All right, we move on to transportation now. And I want to invite all of you to perhaps not filibuster quite as strongly as you have through our first three segments. If you could hold your statement to 60 seconds, I know those of us who are not running for mayor would be greatly appreciative. 
And that, that would constitute all of us, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. On to transportation we move. We had a, a great example of how vulnerable transportation is here in Atlanta earlier this year with the I-85 bridge collapse. What a mess, huh? The Atlanta region expected to grow by 50 percent over the next quarter of a century. Besides MARTA expansion, what initiatives do you have to minimize traffic congestion? Vincent Ford. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I hate that you took MARTA off the table because MARTA does 95 percent of all transit trips in any given day. MARTA and the expansion of mass transit in Atlanta is absolutely critical. That's why last year at the state capitol, uh, I uh, voted to allow Atlanta to put a MARTA referendum on the, uh, on the ballot. Um, uh, and I'm glad that it passed when it was put on the ballot in November of last year. I was con I'm concerned now that apparently the city council is going to go forward with the annexation of Emory and the CDC into the city. And what's going to happen and is that Emory is going to be able to jump in line and go after that money that Atlantans voted for. Uh, I would not be supportive of that annexation if it means that Emory is going to jump in line in front of projects in southwest Atlanta, like the extension of the Martyr Rail from uh, Hamilton Homes to uh, I-285 and MLK. Mary Norwood. There, there are several things that we must do. Um, the traffic congestion where we have developed the city and redeveloped it is stifling for those of us who live in those areas. And so as part of the Renew Atlanta bond, I got the commitment from the administration that they would reduce the traffic congestion through smart technology, through, tr through signal signalization of the traffic lights, um, and a host of other methods. We have to do that, because if we are going to add people all over the city, what I hear is, I love the amenities that you have in your part of town, but I don't want your traffic congestion. So it is critical for us to build light rail, heavy rail, trolleys, bus rapid transit, pedestrian, pedestrian access, bicycle access, all kinds of ways that we can get around in the city, and critical that we build out a regional transit system because it is the people coming in that are absolutely clogging our streets. We welcome them every day, but we need to be able to have them have a way to get to all of our central business districts without clogging neighborhood streets. Quanta Hall. Yes. Well, first we need to fix the roads. We have 200 and... <laughs> politics begin with potholes. Absolutely. We can do the pothole posse. Uh, thank you, Mayor Franklin, for that. Um, that's an easy one to bring back and get these things fixed. We have $200, $250 million for the Renew Atlanta bond program that we've got to roll out a little bit quicker than we've been rolling it out. We have great people there, but it needs to happen now. Um, I'm going to make a top 50 to a top 100 list of congestion hotspots that we really need to tackle from examples such as 285, Cascade 285 to Lyndhurst, or 10th and Monroe, Northside Drive. I mean, the pain that we feel is unnecessary. So we can really focus on this and drill in and not act like it's not there. Um, in terms of neighborhood circulators, we can surely do that to get people in town and in-town neighborhoods where they really want to go, not places we don't go. So I think it's easy, it's a proof of ridership, a great test concept, and I'm going to roll it out maybe before the election. Thank you. Keisha Lance Bottoms. The first thing I would do would be to create a Department of Transportation because the same people who are fixing our roads aren't the same people to fix our traffic. I also think that we have to be creative in looking at other cities. We look at the Northeast and we see how there is a use of existing rail lines, commercial rail lines for public use. But also, at the end of the day, it really is an intersection of all of our issues. We are a city that in a lot of ways is out of balance. We have traffic in Buckhead and in Midtown because we don't have development in Southwest Atlanta. We don't have development in Southwest Atlanta because our schools aren't always thriving in Southwest Atlanta. And so for us to have communities in a city that's in balance, we have to have communities that have good schools. Then we can attract economic development, and then we can have traffic relief throughout the city. But it really is about making each community in this city a destination place. Susan Mitchell. Well, 
Well, the first thing I want to do as mayor is to synchronize the street lights. Uh, you know, we've got lights throughout the city, and you stop at every light, and you not only uh, give yourself a headache having to stop at every light, you make the environment a much worse place with, with gas emissions. Uh, but also, it's hard to talk about uh, reducing traffic congestion without talking about MARTA. But without talking about expansion, here's what, we, what we've got to do. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're providing strong uh, services around MARTA to create true uh, doorstep to destination solutions. So as mayor, I'm going to make sure that we create partnerships uh, between MARTA uh, and what we do with our bicycles so people can get connected to MARTA and be able to use an application, maybe even to use a ride share to start the first leg of their trip to get to MARTA and then have as a last mile solution, uh, another rideshare vehicle, or in the future, an autonomous vehicle. So we've got to make sure that the trip that you take on MARTA is one that can take you from the beginning uh, to end. Uh, the next thing we're going to do when I'm mayor is we're going to make sure that we utilize really creative solutions. Uh, we're going to use staggered work hours. So everybody's not loading into a car at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, for an eight-hour work day at the same time. Uh, we're going to allow for folks to be able to go to work uh, at 11 o'clock and go to 11 to 7. And this is something I believe uh, that city government, working with other, other governments, can really uh, lead the charge on and then get the, the private sector involved. So we've got to be creative. We've got to also augment MARTA so that we can reduce uh, congestion by increasing our ridership. And we've got to make sure that we're doing uh, some really serious work with our street light synchronization. Peter Raymond. The citizens of Atlanta are about to make a bet the farm decision on the next mayor and city council. There are two once in a generation things that are going to happen. One is the complete rezoning of the city, the changing of the laws that allow what buildings to be built where. If we build the wrong buildings in the wrong places, we will make traffic unbearably worse. The second once in a generation opportunity and risk is the spending of up to $14 billion on transportation infrastructure. This is the most amount of money in a generation, really, since we built MARTA. So we have to have, at the vision level, a plan that links together the spending of that money fairly and efficiently and effectively with planning. And then at the tactical level, we need to do a series of things. We need to de-bottleneck intersections. We don't need to just synchronize traffic lights. They need to be centrally controlled from a command post like a few other best-in-class cities do. You can then use machine learning, artificial intelligence to manage and optimize the flow throughout the city and adjust to incidents on the highways. We certainly need light rail and heavy rail and sidewalks and bike paths, but all of this has to work together. Ms. Willard. Well, Jeff, before I tell you what I'm going to do, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I am not going to do, as Ms. Norwood has proposed with gubernatorial candidate Casey Cagle, going to drill under the highway and build more roads. Um, it's ridiculously expensive, and one day they're going to have to come out from that hole and they're going to be on our streets again. What I'm going to do is lay down five transit lines across the city, <laughs> around the Beltline, from Bankhead extend the streetcar from Bankhead to the other side, North Avenue, North Side Drive, Joseph Boone. Then we're going to orient density around those nodes and build commercial amenities so that people have ways to get done what they need to do without having to get into their car. I also want to make sure that we're working regionally to expand transportation across the region. Uh, and then I want to go to the General Assembly and get them to help us use part of the gas tax for transit operations, because no transit system in the world operates on the fare box like we require MARTA to do. We're the 49th, we're the last in the country to not, operate, to not use gas tax for transit operations. We've got a lot of things to do. I started working on that when I started working on the Beltline. And finally, what I, just one little thing is, we're going to use transportation impact fees to mitigate transportation impacts where they are built. Ms. Norwood, you uh, were mentioned in that. Yes, there, there are a lot of mischaracterizations that happened during a campaign. And Ms. Is, is it like Boston's Big Dig? Is that what you're talking about? No, sir. What, what happened is many months ago, there was an article by Jim Galloway that talked about Casey Cagle's proposal and a separate proposal that was my proposal, which is a subway coming in from for transit, not for cars, coming in from the northwest part of the region into the Lindbergh Marta Station or the Armour Yards. Because if we can have subway there, we can then have 
commuters who are now clogging our streets, one stop from Buckhead, one stop from Lenox, and one stop from Art Center. And if and when we have the a line coming in from Emory, we then have a second hub in Atlanta and not only the Five Points hub. That is what was proposed in that article and I know Ms. Willard and many other people have believed and, and I assume very innocently that I was espousing Casey Cagle's proposal. I was not. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about the Atlanta streetcar. It's had its critics, a $100 million price tag. Ridership is down. It has not been something that has lived up to its billing. Supporters say that it is uh, one piece to reforming Atlanta's transportation problems, but ridership remains down. Is, is it time to say goodbye to it? Is, it? is it time to say this simply is not working, Vincent Ford? Um. You know, I'm glad City Hall has at least come around to my point of view on who should uh, uh, manage the streetcar. Several years ago, as a member of the Model Oversight Committee at the, the state, I said that it needed to be MARTA who managed it, not the second floor at City Hall. We need to take politics out of it. Only in the last few weeks has City Hall come around to my way of thinking. Um, the, uh, the streetcar over budget. It is a uh, low ridership. Uh, we should rethink the uh, streetcar. And there are some people who want to bring it down Camelton Road, a street dark streetcar down Camelton Road. I think that's misguided. The people I talk to in those neighborhoods along Camelton Road want a lot more than a streetcar. Keisha Lance Bottoms. Well, actually, the voters want to take the streetcar down Campbellton Road because it was part of the project list that the voters supported. Um, I am in support of expansion of the streetcar, and I believe that the streetcar has not been as successful as it could be because it goes places where people don't need it. We have entire segments of this city where people, especially in the service industry, don't have access to transit. So I don't want an 18-year-old at the bus stop at 3 a.m. trying to get to her job at 6 a.m. I want to her, her to have access to mass transit, just as people do in town and in other parts of the city. And so I ask for expansion into Campbellton Road, down Campbellton Road, to the Barge Road Park and Ride, and I'm very excited about it. And I know that the people who use mass transit and rely on transportation each and every day also support it, but more importantly, it also gives Southwest Atlanta the connectivity that Southwest Atlanta needs to the rest of the city so that once again we can balance out the city. All of the redevelopment that we are seeing in the city really is around transit and opportunities. And we have to wrap as we are ending our live television coverage right now. We will continue online at 11alive.com. We thank you for watching. We thank you for being a part of our mayoral forum. Again, we will be online for the next this 30 minutes or so. 11alive.com. This has been brought to you by the AARP, the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, and the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. What if you could lose fat in just a few hours? I don't know what to say. I'm just in shock. You can with Sono Bello. It seems no matter how much you work out or diet, there are parts of your body that just don't seem to change. I went to the gym. I worked out at home. I bought videos. No matter what I did, that bulge was still there. With its advanced micro laser technology, Sono Bello gently removes that targeted fat and shapes your body for life-changing results. As America's number one cosmetic surgery specialist, Sono Bello has performed over 100,000 personalized body and facial procedures, helping tens of thousands of people change their lives. After five years trying to get rid of that roll of fat, Sonabella did it in one day. Call for your free no obligation consultation today and get $250 off your Sonobello body. Payment plans are available. Call 888-403-5932 or go to Sonobello.com. From the team that's holding the powerful accountable with the most accurate weather, 11 Alive News at 10 on the ATL has you covered. Watch 11 Alive News at 10. We can't be there to stop the accident. 
but we can be there for you after it happens. At John Foy & Associates, we're available right now. Whether you're at home or in the hospital, we'll come to you free of charge. He'll stand up for you when you can't stand up for yourself. At Longhorn, step into wood, stone, steak. Don't prepare a meal for yourself. Prepare yourself for a meal. Feast on one of Longhorn Steakhouse Cuts. 12-ounce New York Strip, center cut flows filet. For a limited time, 14-ounce Delmonico. The feeling, the flavor, the place. Longhorn Steakhouse. You can't fake steak. A year ago, I never thought this would have been possible. On my way to work, hit from behind out on I-85. I didn't know if I'd walk again, work again. My wife called John Ford. He went after the insurance company, so we didn't have to. John Foy helped us get back on our feet. 11 Alive and Landmark are proud to present the Star Trek Thunder Truck. I'm Natalie Morales. And I'm Craig Melvin. And this is Dateline on My Network TV. To this day, I still can't believe that she's gone. If I would have known then what I know now, I would have spent more time with her. It's just hard. They married young and started a life together in the rugged beauty of Montana. It's kind of a hidden nugget that not a lot of people know about. She charmed all the locals. Very vibrant. Delightful is the word that comes to mind. For newlyweds Brian and Catherine, Big Sky Country was a paradise. For one of them, it would also become a grave. I remember hysterical crying, screaming. Catherine's lifeless body found in the river. She said, accidents can happen. And I said, this was no accident. Catherine's husband agreed. He told people she was drinking, she was crying, and threatened to kill herself. Suicide? Her friend didn't buy it. Somebody had done this to her. This investigator thought so, too. I had to lay it all out on this huge conference table. And I said, wait a minute. Unearthing two bombshell witnesses. The Andersons heard her die. A dark and damning tale. But would a jury believe it? I made a promise that I will find out who did this, and I will make sure that they're brought to justice. Welcome to Dateline. In a small town where everybody knows each other's business, it seems few really knew what was going on behind closed doors in the Laird household. Catherine Laird appeared to be an intelligent, hardworking young woman who lived life to the fullest. So when she was found dead, the explanation that she took her own life didn't make much sense. Was this a suicide or could it have been something more sinister? Here's Keith Morrison with The Reckoning. Dreams seem to flow downstream somehow. Carried by the river's whims, carried where the current wills them to safety or to sorrow. Here is where they came, the newlyweds, to their own beautiful river, their Montana Eden, where they dreamed their dreams. And where now, these decades later, the silent water may finally give up their secrets. There's never been anything that's been the same since that day. Sherry Harbor is talking about a mystery that seemed beyond solving. The inexplicable thing that happened to her, Sherry's sister, Catherine. You tell people and you're hearing yourself speak and you're thinking, this is like something you see on TV. Do they understand? They don't. And how could we possibly expect them to? And so you go back to the beginning. You search for the answer in the past. And we did everything together. This is Catherine's childhood best friend, Melissa. Either she was at my house or I'm at her house constantly. Mates. Yes, we are. And like I, sisters in a way. We were. We were. We played together. She just had such a zest for life. The memories are idyllic, said Melissa. Those prairie summers under the Texas sun in the swimming pool in Catherine's backyard. She's the one that taught me how to dive in. She was a great swimmer. A strong swimmer? She was. She, was. No, she swam every day. Sherry was the big sister, Catherine the youngest, with a brother, Thomas, wedged in between them. 
She was a champion equestrian rider. She wanted to continue that and then go to veterinary school. So, yes, she loved animals. But most of all, she loved him. He was a part of her life every single day. His name was Ralph. Ralph. And it was her child. One of those little human-like Jack Russell Terriers. Yes, he was a person. He thought he was a member of that family, and he was. Was with her at college, Southern Methodist in Dallas, where Catherine scored A's, rode crew, jumped horses, and was captain of SMU's polo team. And there one day on the grassy polo field, she met a boy, Brian. Brian Laird, another polo player, son of an eminent eye doctor. He was pre-law. And before too long, they were living together. And in the summer, working together in Fort Smith, Montana, population 161. It's a tiny little town, and you get to know everybody really well, and everybody knows pretty much what everybody else is doing. That there's a town at all is due to the Bighorn River, on which June and Gordon Rose ran a tackle shop and lodge. The Bighorn, to any serious fly fisherman, is something like Mecca. It just had such a massive population of fish per mile. There's only half a dozen places like that in the world. Brian worked as a fishing guide. Catherine worked in the tackle shop. They had both just graduated. They come to the river in the summer, you know, for summer jobs. And then after Brian finished law school in the winter of 1999, they got married. The newlyweds moved to Billings, Montana, where Brian set up a small law practice. Catherine put vet school on hold to help Brian run the office. But Brian's heart wasn't really in the law, not when the Bighorn was calling. So they bought a mobile home in Fort Smith, and the two of them picked up where their summer jobs left off. We didn't um, use him very often as a guide, but we did let him carry a tab in the store. He seemed really timid um, around people. And Catherine? Delightful is the word that comes to my mind. Very vibrant, intelligent, devoted. Devoted to what? To Brian. Oh, okay. She was working three jobs that summer. It's true, she worked in our store, cleaned rooms at another lodge, and then the shuttle business. And she was a really hard worker, never showed up for work late. All that spring and early summer of 1999, Brian and Catherine and the Roses and the other Fort Smith fly fishing outfitters worked the river dawn till dark. And the current carried fish and dreams and sparkling flies and darker things. It was the morning of July 31st. One of Catherine's co-workers burst into the tackle shop. Have you seen her? She didn't show up for work. Did she say anything to you? I said, mm. no, um, we haven't seen or heard from her. And she was very worried. And so the other person that was working with me that day said, well, I'll run over to their trailer and check on Brian. But Brian, roused from a deep sleep, had no idea where Catherine was. Somehow, in the middle of the night, she had vanished into the vast wilderness of Montana. The search for Catherine is on, and a friend makes a stunning discovery in the river. Coming up. She alerted Brian right away. She alerted the authorities right away. And a family grapples with the unthinkable. I just remember lots of hysterical crying and screaming. When Dateline continues. Getting your flu shot at Walgreens is easier than ever. Just walk right in and pay zero dollars with most insurance. Plus, when you get a flu shot at Walgreens, you help provide a life-saving vaccine to a child in need through the UN Foundation. It's that easy to get your flu shot and make a difference. So swing by your local Walgreens today. Walgreens, at the corner of happy and healthy. COPD makes it hard to breathe. So to breathe better, I go with a Noro. COPD tries to say go this way. I say I'll go my own way with a Noro. 
Once Daily Anoro contains two medicines called bronchodilators that work together to significantly improve lung function all day and all night. Anoro is not for asthma. It contains a type of medicine that increases risk of death in people with asthma. The risk is unknown in COPD. Anoro won't replace rescue inhalers for sudden symptoms and should not be used more than once a day. Tell your doctor if you have a heart condition, high blood pressure, glaucoma, prostate, bladder, or urinary problems. These may worsen with Anoro. Call your doctor if you have worsened breathing, chest pain, mouth or tongue swelling, problems urinating, vision changes, or eye pain while taking Anoro. Ask your doctor about Anoro. Get your first prescription free at anoro.com. If you've ever considered getting a walk-in tub, we have great news. No more cold seats. For a limited time, when you purchase a Safe Step walk-in tub, we'll upgrade your order to include our newest feature, a heated seat. That's a $600 value, free. But that's not all. The new and improved dual hydrotherapy system now has foot massaging jets to help soothe aching feet. And as always, Safe Step walk-in tubs are built to maximize safety so you can stay in your home and enjoy the comforts of bathing again. Call the number on your screen now for more information and a free, no obligation consultation. Our new walk-in tub is affordable and could change your life. Thousands of people just like you are already enjoying the safety and luxury comfort of their Safe Step walk-in tub. Financing is available, so call 1-800-600-6031. That's 1-800-600-6031. You deserve it. Call and get yours today. 60% of women are wearing the wrong size patch and can experience leaks. Discover Always My Fit. Find the number that's right for your flow and panty size on the top of any Always pack. The better the fit, the better it protects. Always. What you doing? Just checking my free credit score at Credit Karma. What the? Don't you know that checking your credit score lowers it? Actually, checking your credit score with Credit Karma doesn't affect it at all. I guess I could just check my credit score then. Credit Karma. Get knowing. <laughs> A terrible dread spread up and down the Bighorn River that morning of July 31st, 1999, when Catherine Laird failed to turn up for work. A missing persons report was filed. Brian, her distraught husband, went up and down the river calling, looking. So did her neighbors. And pretty soon, one of them, driving past a reservoir the locals call the After Bay, saw something in the water, looked human. She alerted Brian right away. She alerted the authorities right away. Brian Laird raced to the after bay, plunged into the freezing water, carried the body to shore. It was Catherine. It was too late. She was just 28 years old. By then, a gaggle of law enforcement had arrived. It was crazy. There's many entities out there. You got FBI, you got BIA, you got the Park Service, you mm. got county jurisdiction, you have state jurisdiction. But it was the FBI whose agent took charge of the scene. Catherine was found wearing sweatpants and a shirt and a bra, but no shoes or socks. Her white forerunner was located in a parking lot about 100 yards from where her body was found. Inside the vehicle, they found her purse, eyeglasses, some prescription antidepressants of Brian's, and a half-empty bottle of tequila. A shell shock, Brian was driven 40 miles to a doctor in Hardin, Montana, and sedated. And a thousand miles away in Texas, Sherry got a call from her mother. She says she just received this horrible telephone call from Brian. All he kept saying was, there's been a horrible accident. I just remember lots of hysterical, crying, screaming, my mom just saying she's gone. Sherry rushed to her mother's house. That's when she said, Catherine drowned. And I said, no, she did not. And she said, no, accidents can happen. And I said, no, I assure you this was no accident. My sister would not drown. Did you have an idea what happened? No, at the time I really didn't. Neither did Catherine's friend, Melissa. Like, who are you talking about? Drown? She can swim. What are you talking about? I mean, not just swim, but swim. Yeah, yeah. and you know, all I could picture was a swimming pool. A distraught family flew to Montana. Brian met us at the airport. What sort of state was he in? Very lethargic. You could tell he was taking something yeah. to calm him down. What happened? 
The night before, said Brian, he and Catherine argued for hours. He, to avoid her anger, went to sleep, he said. And she, agitated, upset, woke him up, asked him to take care of Ralph, as if she was never coming back to the dog she loved like a child, then got into her forerunner and drove away into the night. Last time he saw her alive, he said. So she must have taken his pills with her, and that tequila must have downed so much booze and medication that well, she either drowned accidentally, or much more likely, he said, she committed suicide. Or not grandfathered in, I think it's supportive. It's a, an initiative that many cities that are very progressive have already done. So we're a little behind in this one. All right, let's let's go a little bit quicker on this, Ms. Wooler. Well, this isn't about being progressive. This is about helping people breathe. I support clean indoor air. I, I don't think that we should have cigar bars. And I do um, want you to know that I led a coalition of people to help raise the cigarette tax at 25 cents a number of years ago for the first time ever because of the work I do with nonprofit organizations. So I'm there early and often for smoke-free air. We've got one of the highest asthma rates in the country, um, and we need to get on with it. Mr. Mitchell. I'm in favor of smoke-free environment, point blank, point simple. Nothing more to it. Uh, you know, in terms of the airport, I think there's a conversation about whether or not to have some sort of uh, smoking area, cigar bars, and all that. I'm, in, I'm adamantly uh, opposed to that. I believe we should remove even the smoking areas that are designated in the airport out of the airport. Mary Norwood. I want to see how we can have both sides coexist. And so I will say that in the airport, if there is a way that we can make sure that smoke does not infiltrate back into the terminal, back into the, into the atrium, then I am not against having those people who choose to have cigars or cigarettes be able to do that. Ms. Bottom. My father died at age 55 of heart disease, primarily brought on by smoking, so I have very personal feelings about it. Um, I do generally support a smoke-free environment, but I do think as it relates to our airport and you have people, it's an international airport, I do think that we need to have an outdoor smoking area. And I don't think that I could go home tonight if I told my husband I supported closing cigar bars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, <clears throat> I'm in favor of smoke-free legislation. The details have to be worked out. Particular to the airport, though, we should not be selling and promoting cigars at the airport. We may need a smoking area outside or in some place for international connections, but we should have the airport as smoke-free as possible. And if, frankly, uh, drugstores can give up selling cigarettes for the health of their customers, surely we should be able to give up selling cigars at our airport for the health of our citizens. Mr. Fortz. Uh, if that kind of legislation was to come to my desk as mayor, I would sign it. I have, um, going back many, many years, uh, I've done research on the impact of secondhand smoke, uh, particularly on children. Uh, so that is something that I would, uh, that kind of legislation you outlined, Jeff, would be legislation I would be glad to sign. How about the... Um Let's move along here on annexation. Where do you stand on the annexation of Emory University, the CDC, and the Children's Health Care of Atlanta? Is that a good or a bad idea, Mary Norwood? Um, I support annexation any time that entities wish to come into the city of Atlanta, that we do the service delivery um, analysis and we can effectively make the agreement work so that we are not um, having the city take on uh, new responsibilities that are out of sync with what we can afford. Um, so I have always been in favor of any, in any part of our region coming into the city and I'm in support of this one. Cesar Mitchell. I support the annexation of Emory University. I believe it's a great opportunity for us to expand the city limits to two very important institutions, the CDC as well as, as, well as Emory University. However, there are two things I think we've got to be very clear about and two things that really will make my support contingent. Number one, we've got to make sure that we expand Atlanta public school systems borders all the way to the end. Uh, you can't do half and half. I think that's inappropriate, and I have no reason, I have no understanding, I have no idea why that 
actually is, uh, has not been resolved, number one. Number two, uh, and this issue has been raised uh, during this campaign, I also believe uh, that we should not displace any projects uh, that the citizens of Atlanta have approved through the TSPLOS uh, in favor of uh, uh, the project uh, that would take transit to Emory without DeKalb County being a part of the funding of that. We cannot do that point blank. Future Lance Bottoms. I do support the annexation of Emory um, and that entire area, and I also worked very hard for several years to annex several neighborhoods in southwest Atlanta. We were successful for some, but there were about 3,000 residents that did not have the opportunity to join the city of Atlanta because Mary Norwood worked alongside the Republican Party to block those annexations. These were primarily African-American neighborhoods in southwest Atlanta, and in before one of the committees regarding annexations in the Northeast area and the Southwest area, Mary Norwood said that she didn't know that we had the capacity. Uh, she was concerned about our capacity to bring on more residents into the city in Southwest Atlanta, but she has not expressed that same concern about bringing in an entire university. Mary Norwood. expressed this um, rebut this response several times and evidently Ms. Keisha Lance Bottoms has um, some trouble in understanding it so let me let me express it to you we as a city council would authorize the the petitions that came into the city and you had to have 60 percent of the voters in the area and 60 percent of the property owners in the area the analysis did not make 60 percent the smallest neighborhood had 58 percent the medium-sized neighborhood had 45 percent and the largest neighborhood had 37 percent there was not they did not comply with the law so i was not not in support of violating the law and having fraudulent petitions accepted by our city council. All right. In brief, as I said at the beginning, we have a structural problem in the city of Atlanta. We have a revenue shortfall because of our small size in the metro area. So because of that, in order to invest in infrastructure to provide for schools for our children, we need to grow as a city. So I have consistently been in favor of having areas join the city that wanted to join the city where we could do so uh, to the benefit of everybody. I was in favor of South Fulton. I would frankly still love the new city of South Fulton to someday join the city of Atlanta. And I believe we can run the city of Atlanta well enough, so well that people will join us. Kathy Willard, I got about 30 seconds for you on this, if you'd like to add. Well, I, I am in support of any annexation as long as we have all the information, like how much tax revenue will it generate and how much will it cost to to serve the area. We don't know that information about Emory, clearly, and we don't always know that about others. So before we even start the conversation, we need to know those two things, and then specific to Emory, about the school system, which kids are going to go to which schools, and also this transit issue. I don't think the city council should move forward on this annexation until we know all that information and be really clear. Are we going to fund that transit system, or aren't we? Because if we're not, they might not want to come to us. All right, uh, closing statements here, and we will wrap this up. You get 60 seconds for a closing statement. Don't go any more than that. Please, please. Uh, we, are, we are making our way toward the finish line here, but 60 seconds for your vision, for your closing statement about why you should be the next mayor of Atlanta. And we are going to go from right to left, right down the line. You ready? Mr. Hall, begin it, if you would. Yes, I've said this before. I want to say thank you all for having us. Uh, Atlanta doesn't need a white mayor, black mayor, gay mayor, or straight mayor. Atlanta needs a great mayor, a mayor who put people and neighborhoods first, as I've done in the heart of the city, in downtown, midtown, Old 44, Emmett Park, Ponce Highlands. I represent the area with the greatest concentration of poverty in the Southeast United States, and we've empowered families and children to own their own future. There's a part of our city that's been left behind, and we've had leaders who have done nothing to support neighborhoods like Southwest Atlanta and Adamsville. Call your heights. All these neighborhoods have been left behind, and we need a leader who will commit to delivering upon the promise that our city has been offering and selling. Ms. Willard. Jeff, I'm Kathy Willard, and I want to be the next mayor because I'm fighting for ATL, affordability, 
transportation, and livability. Affordability across the board so that we provide a range of housing for people from homeless people to kids out of school to people with large families or small and at all income levels and seniors living in place. Transportation so that we can move around this city again and people can live lives uh, and enjoy their families before and after work. And livability is about having schools that work, great art and parks, um, public safety, and making sure that we have economic development that supports everybody at all levels of income. I'm Kathy Willard. I'm fighting for ATL. Mr. Mitchell. I'm Cesar Mitchell. I was born and raised in this city, and I was born into a city that was a village for me uh, and my brother. Uh, my father passed away when I was very young, almost 10 years old, uh, and my mom, as a single mother, had to figure out how to raise two boys as a single mother. Uh, she had around her and we had around us a village, a place where we could go to school, a recreation center, family and friends who took care of us. I'm running for mayor because I want this city uh, to meet the promise that it has for every young person growing up in this city. I want to make sure that the city of Atlanta is a place where families can grow and prosper in place and have the ability to have access to affordable housing so that they know that they can prosper in this city. I want to make sure that if you're a senior citizen, that you are able to know that you're going to be able to age gracefully in place. Uh, when opportunity goes up, crime goes down. And when crime goes down, quality of life goes up. I'm ready to leave this city. I know how to leave this city, and I want to serve you as your next mayor. I don't want to be your mayor. I want to serve you as your next mayor. I'm Cesar Mitchell. Mr. Norway. I'm Mary Norwood, and I want to be your mayor. I have served all of the citizens of this city for 25 years, both as a community advocate and as an at-large citywide council person. I know this city intimately, and I have been working for years to protect communities, preserve neighborhoods, and bring the quality of life everyone deserves. I want every community in this city to be prosperous, to be healthy, to be safe, to be sustainable, to be affordable, to be beautiful, to be exciting, to be all that Atlanta has to offer. We are at an important turning point in this city, and I want to restore the trust that our citizens should have in our city government. I will deliver a transparent, accountable, responsive government so you can have the quality of life and all that Atlanta should have to, for you to enjoy. Ms. Bottoms. Atlanta is a tale of two cities, and I am the only candidate for mayor who has lived and worked in both those places. I know what it's like to live with a single mother who's working two jobs, going back to school just so she can provide the basic necessities for her family. But I also know what the promise is of this city. I know what it's like to graduate from Douglas High School, Florida a &M University, Georgia State University College of Law, and then go on to lead and facilitate the sale of Turner Field, a $250 million redevelopment. That's what the promise is of this city. It's about opportunity on the other side of our challenges. I'm running for mayor for four reasons. My four children, Lance, Langston, Lincoln, and Lennox. I want this city to be the beloved community for them in the way that it was for me. But it cannot be a beloved community for them if it's not for your families and your communities as well. I am Keisha Lance Bottoms. I ask for your support and your prayers. Thank you. Mr. Amon. My name is Peter Amon. I am the only candidate on this stage that brings together several unique attributes. First, experience. I've actually run the city of Atlanta government on a day-to-day -day basis. I also have the experience of over 25 years in business, helping some of the world's most complex organizations improve customer service and improve operations. I have the ethics of having held people to the highest ethical standards, both in government and in the private sector. And finally, I've demonstrated leadership in bringing together the four areas of Atlanta that really make change happen. The people in the neighborhoods, the nonprofit sector, the government, and the private sector. In many cases, whether it's helping found a nonprofit to serve the homeless or helping found a nonprofit to help the police, I have worked across all four of those areas to advance Atlanta. 
My name is Peter Amon. I want to help advance Atlanta, all of us together. Mr. Forks. I'm running for mayor because I think Atlanta City Hall has lost its way. I think that City Hall has been watching out for these last seven or eight years, have been watching out for millionaires and billionaires as opposed to regular people in neighborhoods. Uh, the, you know, you're right, Jeff. We started this journey eight months ago, and we've had 40 of these sessions. And guess what? All these folks are starting to sound like Senator Ford, talking about income inequality, income and mobility, and the need to watch out for little people. That's why Bernie Sanders, Roy Barnes, and 30 labor unions are supporting me. That's why I asked the Dardens, who are sitting right over there, Ms. Darden, that's why the Dardens and Tanya Washington is here, because when they ask these people to watch out for them, to not displace them, not use do eminent domain and evict them, all of them voted to evict them. The time has come for a change at City Hall. I'm that change. My name is Vincent Ford, and I need your support. Thank you. Well, that concludes the mayoral forum tonight. We wish to thank the 100 black men of Atlanta and all the great work that they do in our city and beyond. We also want to thank AARP for their sponsorship as this, of this as well, along with 11 Alive. So we encourage you to get out and vote and let your voice be heard. I'm Jeff Hullinger. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on 11 Alive.